Welcome everyone to AURI Connect's Fields of Innovation, part of AURI Connect's online series featuring updates on the work that AURI is doing to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. I'm Dan Scogan, AURI's Director of Industry and Government Relations and your host for Fields of Innovation. The AURI Connect's program is hosted by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. Fields of Innovation is focused on bringing together Minnesota's regional ag and food value chains to build capacity and successfully commercialize new and emerging crops. Events will focus on highlighting new crops, examining marketing opportunities for emerging crops, and highlighting new technologies in existing crops. Remember that this event is being recorded and archived and can be found at auri.org. Also remember participants are muted but you can ask questions through the Q&A portal on your screen. Today, we start a conversation around indoor agriculture production, known in the industry as Controlled Environment Agriculture, or CEA. The emerging trend toward growing food indoors holds considerable promise for enhancing Minnesota's ability to feed more people by extending growing seasons, especially in our northern climate. AURI is proud to present this series, sponsored by Bremer Bank to highlight the innovations and market trends creating new opportunities for the growth of indoor agricultural production in Minnesota and other Northern states. Now let's listen to an important message from Bremer Bank. Hello, and welcome to today's Field of Innovation webinar. I'm Melissa Carmichael, VP of Strategy and Innovation here at Bremer Bank. At Bremer, we are very proud to partner with AURI and other organizations that find innovative ways to do more. For generations, we have worked to cultivate thriving communities by being the trusted banking partner of farmers and agribusiness in our region. It is in part to this we are very proud to be the ninth largest ag lender in the US. So again, we would like to thank you for all that you do to increase the value of Minnesota's agricultural economy. We hope you enjoy today. Thank you. This will be a three-part series, not only today, but also in March and April. Today, we will be exploring how and why innovative CEA technologies are developing new opportunities for the industry. Examine how consumer demand is driving the development of local and regional food systems, and we'll learn more about the capital and energy investments that growers may consider when entering the industry. Our guests today include Dr. Mary Rogers, an associate professor in the Department of Horticultural Science at the University of Minnesota. Mary earned an ABS in Environmental Horticulture and MS in Entomology from the University of Minnesota and PhD in Plants, Soils, and Insects with a specialization in Integrated Pest Management from the University of Tennessee. Her research program investigates plant-insect interactions and biological and environmental strategies to improve the production of vegetables and fruits in the Upper Midwest. Mary's research focuses on organic production, controlled environment agriculture, urban agriculture, and integrated pest management. Dr. Rogers teaches courses in urban agriculture, ecology, vegetable production, and a professional experience internship course, and serves as a major coordinator for the Interdisciplinary Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems major at the University of Minnesota. A community-engaged scholar, Mary actively collaborates with growers and community partners throughout her research and teaching programs to catalyze food systems change. We'll also hear today from Jill Eide, member of Commercial Industrial and Agriculture Strategist for Great River Energy. Jill has been in the utility industry working on commercial, industrial, and agricultural programs for a decade at both distribution and generation and transmission level cooperatives. The variety of these programs span from traditional lighting and HVAC conservation to electric forklift and robotic, robotic milking systems. Much of the CI and A program work is uh, for state regulatory compliance, but also crosses over into key account engagement. She led the development of Great River Energy's voluntary green tariff program, Wellspring for Business, when distribution cooperative members were asking for tools to help business accounts attain sustainability goals. Currently, Jill is the project manager for the EPRI collaboration project with the Indoor Food Production Container Researching Energy Needs for Controlled Environment 
agriculture applications. Jill is the recipient of the 2021 Young Energy Professional of the Year from the Association of Energy Engineers and champions initiatives such as the annual Minnesota Energy Expo and educational event in collaboration with the local ASHRAE chapter. Also joining us today will be Nicola Kerslake. Nicola is the founder of Contain Incorporated, a fintech hub for controlled environment agriculture. The company works with over 50 leading equipment vendors with a pool of over 30 lenders to facilitate indoor agriculture equipment leases. It's home to two additional indoor agriculture platforms, micro learning platform, rooted global, and pre-owned farm equipment, marketplace equipped. This is her second venture in indoor agriculture, having founded, built, and successfully exited Indoor Ag Con, a premier industry event. Previously, she worked in real assets investments in Europe, in Asia, and in the United States at companies such as ABN Ambro and others. So let's get started. Dr. Mary Rogers, welcome to this edition of Fields of Innovation. Hi, I'm pleased to be here. Thanks for the invite and I'm really excited on this conversation on CEA with my fellow panelists. Um, so I want to just highlight a couple of different projects that I'm currently involved in related to controlled environment agriculture. One of these is a project focused on hydroponic lettuce production using the nutrient film technique. So this project was funded by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture Specialty Crops Block Grant Program and is in partnership with hydroponic producers in Minnesota. So the objectives of the research are to better understand the role of nutrient management, plant growth, and response of the green peach aphid, which is, are common pests in these systems. Um, because hydroponic growers are often reliant on biological control to manage pests in these systems, we're also interested in studying biocompatibility of common biological control agents, including generalist predators and parasitoids with commonly used OMRI or organic approved pest products. So really working with growers to optimize production and pest management in these systems. Um, and through this partnership, we were also really excited to partner with Spark Y Youth Action Labs, which is a nonprofit based in uh, Minneapolis that empowers youth through hands-on education rooted in sustainability and entrepreneurship. Um, so we work with them to develop educational materials and resources on integrated pest management in hydroponics and aquaponics specifically. So for students in elementary and high schools. And then we've also interacted with several industry partners in this work, including BioBest, which is an insectary supplying biological control agents, Java Cycle, Crop King, and, and lots of other local growers. So if we're wrap, wrapping up this project and our data collection is just finished, so we'll be sharing everything we've learned via the University of Minnesota Extension channels, um, the fruit and veg, veggie newsletter, and on social media. So stay tuned for more information on what we found. Um, so another controlled environment ag related activity I've been involved with is in partnership with the University of Minnesota Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships and this network of deep winter greenhouse producers. So deep winter greenhouses are these really novel, you know, innovative um, passively solar heated structures so that they don't have inherent um, heat capacity. So it's all solar powered designed specifically for winter production in cold climates and in northern climates. And so what growers are producing in these typically are cold hardy salad mixes and greens. Um, and it's a way for them to grow these things energy efficiently and sustainably to maximize local production in what's traditionally the off season for a lot of our specialty crop producers here. So our research um, in, in this area focused on cultivar trials so different growing different types of salad green, mustard green, specialty Asian greens, using different organic sources of fertility and substrates um, across these what we've characterized as winter subseasons characterized by photo periods. So in the fall we have diminishing light um, quality. Um, into the solstice we have very dark um, short um, days and then expansion is right now when we're experiencing um, longer days and increasing solar radiation. So optimizing production for each of those different subseasons, um, and really working with growers to, to learn more about these novel systems and how to grow things better in them. And so more information on deep winter greenhouses is available online through the University of Minnesota Extension and through the Deep Winter Producers Network. So there's a number of different growers that are exchanging information and knowledge and 
um, helping each other out <laughs> with these systems. So um, a really great partnership there. So I wanna also plug, um, it's not just myself working in this area. There's lots of other colleagues in the College of Food, Ag and Natural Resource Sciences at the University of Minnesota working on related research directions, including aquaponics. And there's a lot of um, interest right now in developing remote sensing and automation um, to get around some of these labor challenges that producers are experiencing and for production efficiency overall. Um, I'm excited that there's so much interest in controlled environment ag globally and, and also here in Minnesota. I'm happy to also share news that our Department of Horticultural Science is prioritizing a new faculty hire in this area. So we're going to have even deeper and more expertise <laughs> in the future. So hopefully fostering new ways to exchange information with growers, um, more public private partnerships in CEA. So um, I think there's a bright future ahead for this. And then one last plug that um, our curriculum in plant sciences and food systems, we're building work, the workforce and new professionals in this area. So um, always will, um, interested in connecting with folks, businesses, organizations that would like to host student interns or have um, available job openings for some of our current students or a recent graduate. So um, with that, I will pass it over um, to the next panelist. Okay, great. And uh, we'll send it over to uh, Jill Eide, uh, give us a little update on what uh, GRE and, uh, and uh, she is working on. Jill? Thank you, Dan. Um, I wanted to start off with a little bit of who is Great River Energy. And we are a wholesale generation and transmission cooperative utility. And that means we own and operate the power plants and the high voltage transmission lines. And then we provide that wholesale electricity to 28 distribution cooperatives across the state. As you can see here on the map, um, we collectively serve about 60% of Minnesota or about 700,000 homes, farms, and businesses, which is about 1.7 million people across the state. And our mission is to provide a reliable, affordable electricity in harmony with a sustainable environment. So why are electric utilities interested in controlled environment agriculture or indoor agriculture? The bottom line is because we're, we're really, these facilities use electricity through their grow lights, through the HVAC cooling and dehumidification systems, and of course the water circulation pumps as well. We're interested in this industry because we need to better understand the power requirements when sizing our infrastructure for these types of facilities. We're also interested in this industry because it, it has a favorable load factor, which helps us keep our rates stable over time. And then we also like the scalability attribute, attributes. Um, so it can work in different applications from a, a small scale, uh, 320 square foot shipping container for maybe a restaurant or a cafeteria, all the way up to large warehouses and greenhouses to supply uh, regional area grocery stores. But what we're quickly learning is really the long-term sustainability benefits of having fresh, affordable, local produce in our rural communities. So vertical farming doesn't generally use soil, which is the primary source of contamination in produce. Conventionally grown produce is harvested 13 days or, or almost two weeks before it reaches the grocery store whereas locally grown indoor produce is farm to table in hours rather than days or weeks, which reduces spoilage and waste. Locally grown produce reduces the average 2000 diesel truck miles it travels to reach a grocery store. And then of course the associated transportation emissions. Global supply of fruits and vegetables are 22% short of global nutritional needs. Almost a quarter of the world is malnourished and this is disproportionately affecting low income and underprivileged communities. And then as we start to think about changing land use, right here in the Twin Cities, we see urban sprawl with farm fields becoming housing developments and shopping centers. So vertical growing really starts to address changing land use by attaining up to a 50 times greater yield than conventional uh, produce field farming 
because we can fit more growing vertically without growing without using more acres horizontally, but also through that climate controlled facility, which optimizes and shortens crop cycles. Um, but it also enables that year round growing under those optimal climate conditions, which is really critical here in Minnesota and in cold climates. And then indoor ag uses 95% less water than conventional field produce farming. And of course, water conservation is important now, but even more so into the future as population continues to grow. So a little bit about our project partners. Um, we have this indoor food production container, which we've branded Soda Grown. And we do have a Facebook page if you wanna follow along with any of our harvesting or get a virtual tour of what the inside looks like. But this project is really a collaboration of quite a few partners. So first we've got the Electric Power Research Institute. And through EPRI, we are part of a national research and development initiative looking at container farming and the CEA industry at large. So in this project, EPRI is our independent academic third party that is focusing on the data evaluation and analysis for us. And then locally, we've got the, we've got Todd Wadena Electric Cooperative. They're the sponsoring distribution cooperative. Uh, they provide power to two of the top 10 egg counties in our state, so Todd and Medina counties. And both counties also happen to represent the lowest household income counties in the state and are also a federally designated food desert area, so meaning they lack access to fresh and affordable produce year round. And Todd Wadena has really been crucial with the installation of the metered electric service and with a lot of the electrical work with installing data uh, sensors and the electric panel for the container. Central Lakes College is uh, a local agricultural college based out of Staples, Minnesota. They've been a catalyst for research in central, central Minnesota for 50 plus years. And they're really our container site host and our day-to-day -day operator. And then we've got Lakewood Health Systems, and they are a local health care provider and our distribution partner for the produce. They offer this food pharmacy program um, that provides meals to hunger, health, nutrition qualified recipients. And they feed over 600 individuals and families in the Staples, Minnesota area, many of which are elderly or low income demographics. So the Todd Wadena container was the original concept, but since our installation back in 2020, we've had three more cooperatives partner with their local communities on container farming. So we're definitely seeing a need and a desire to engage with, with this industry and this technology, um, but also the, the food supply chain. So I wanted to share um, some logistics and lessons learned. Throughout this project, we have learned a lot, both things like 2020 hindsight, things we should have done, but also thinking about things we want to try based on our experience. So energy, water, labor, supplies, these are the four fundamental items to think about from an operations and logistics standpoint. So where is your energy coming from? Is there an electric service or a transformer nearby for your container? Or if you're thinking of building a warehouse, where is that power coming from? Who is the project champion? Um, when things get challenging, who is the lead person to figure it out? Maybe it's you because it's your container. Or if it's an organization, maybe there needs to be a senior staff sponsor. But also, um, as you get going, what are your labor, your day-to-day -day labor resources? Do you need um, additional help? And then where is your water coming from? Our container delivery occurred on the coldest day of January, 2020 in the middle of a blizzard. Um, it was doable, but I don't recommend that. <laughs> also um, getting a delivery winter delayed trenching in the water access until spring. So we were carrying five gallon buckets to fill the reservoirs. Where are your supplies coming from? So the nutrients, seeds, cleaning chemicals, um, what if your supplier changes supplies? Because ours did. We had to find a new supplier because the old products yielded better results. And then all of these logistical operational issues are super important, but what's the business plan or what's the business model? 
where is the revenue or the funding coming from to pay for the energy, the water, the labor, and the supplies? Are you selling wholesale? Are you selling retail? Or maybe you're a food shelf and where maybe you have grant funding, where are those fundings, uh, the, the revenue or the funding coming from long-term? I think those are very important questions that we've learned to ask and to continue to ask throughout this project. So I know we're saving questions till the end, but I did wanna provide my contact information if anybody wants to reach out. And um, thank you very much for, for having me today. Thank you, Jill. Uh, very informative, and uh, we're going to move right along. I do want to remind uh, people who are participating today, watching, learning, listening, that uh, if you have questions uh, for any of our presenters, you can put those in the Q&A portal on your screen, and we'll be getting to uh, questions after we hear from our uh, third presenter today. Our third presenter is Nicola Kerslake, and uh, Nicola, we'll uh, turn the program over to you and uh, uh, look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Ray, and uh, thanks to AURI for having us today. Uh, my name is Nicola Kurzek. I'm the founder of Contain Inc. We are a fintech platform that provides a number of services to indoor farmers. Uh, we are probably best known for our leasing program where we match uh, indoor farmers with our pool of just over 30 lenders to help them find lease financing. Uh, last year, we launched a platform called Equipped, which is a, essentially an eBay for used indoor agriculture equipment. Um, and then we also have a micro learning platform called Rooted, which helps corporate employees learn to grow a little of their own food at home. As part of these endeavors, we, um, we track a fair amount of what's happening both in trends of the industry and in uh, funding trends. Um, the slides that I'm going to use today are from our 2021 funding review that we um, released last month. And if you want to download um, the full review, uh, you can do that at our website, which is contain.ag. Um, and we really track funding trends across three areas. Firstly, private funding, um, then public markets, and then finally, M&A. Uh, private funding is obviously the biggest piece of this for the industry at the moment, and it more than tripled last year. Primarily, it goes to farms who are offering investors a pathway to profitable fund farming, um, usually uh, via tech. Um, and uh, there's generally also a, a promise around uh, making local supply more available to, to their communities. About half of this private funding or just under half went to the New York region last year, but we're certainly seeing more diverse patterns. With, and in particular, we're seeing um, higher levels of funding in Europe at the moment. 2022 has continued with uh, much of the same. Uh, notably in late January, we saw a, the largest round that we've seen so far, which was from Plenty. They did a Series E, which was $400 million. So it looks like this year we're going to end up with a, a bigger number again. What's driving this interest, um, aside from the long noted um, consumer preferences for uh, better, fresher uh, produce, um, have really been trends that have become more prominent during the pandemic. The first is, as Jill mentioned, there's an increased focus on sustainability um, and on the ability of um, indoor agriculture to reduce some of the, um, some of the impact of traditional farming. Um, and then in addition, um, there's an increasing concern, of course, around the supply chain. And we're seeing uh, large numbers of uh, grocery store and restaurant chains uh, wanting to have more control over their, their own supply chain. And notably, one of the investors in the uh, plenty round that I mentioned was Walmart. Public markets have not been as kind to indoor agriculture. Um, it's a much smaller universe. Um, there were four listings last year, um, but they're primarily uh, tech suppliers, um, folks like Cubic Farms in Canada, who are supplying um, grow systems and um, other equipment into the industry. 
Um, and it's been a very mixed relationship with the listed sector. So notably last year, Aero Farms pulled a what's called a SPAC listing um, from the market, um, having failed to, to uh, gather investor support for it. Um, and right now there is another uh, SPAC that's, that's being marketed uh, through Calera uh, or for Calera, which is um, a firm that is currently listed in Oslo that is looking to relist itself um, on one of the US exchanges. Um, but it's uh, the performance of indoor agriculture on the listed market has not been great uh, to date. More positively there, we are seeing the beginning of a very active M&A scene in um, indoor agriculture. So we see two big trends here. The first is uh, tech companies combining with one another to uh, gather scale. Um, and so one example of that would be uh, Signify and, and Fluence, which are two lighting companies uh, merging. Um, the other is we're seeing an indoor farmers, particularly successfully venture capital backed ones, um, adding uh, technology in particular, or adding rivals to expand their geographic footprint. Um, and Calera is a good example of that last year. They both acquired a rival that gave them some exposure to the Middle East, um, and they acquired a seed breeding specialist um, called Vindara to uh, help on the tech side. Again, this, um, this trajectory is, is continuing. Uh, last month, Bowery Farming, a New York-based um, indoor farmer, acquired uh, a strawberry harvesting company that's known for its robotics and, and 3D um, vision. So what comes next from here? Now, when we wrote this uh, last month, um, it seemed pretty obvious what was going to happen. Um, there's still a lot of dry powder. There's still a lot of uh, funding around. Investors remain very interested in the sector. Um, and with a combination of the increased focus on ESG issues um, and a continuing booming uh, public market, our expectation was that private funding in particular would continue apace. At the same time, a number of the earlier investors in the sector are beginning to get impatient because they have not seen the returns that they were promised. And in turn, we expect that to drive uh, continued M&A within the sector. Um, however, everything changed this week. And so I don't think after the, um, uh, the, the uh, issues in Ukraine that we can really say that we know what's gonna happen next. Um, so in particular, as uh, many will be aware, energy is a real challenge for um, indoor farmers, normally about a third of their operating costs are energy. Uh, and it's one of the issues on which they have been criticized because it's far higher than for traditional farming. Um, given the likely uh, sharp rise in energy costs from here, I think we're going to see um, a lot more companies focusing on sustainability solutions to um, energy and working with folks like Jill on uh, load balancing and on um, and on uh, adding solar and adding other alternate energy uh, to their grows. And uh, we have already seen uh, some questions from uh, investors on our end as to how um, how that can be um, best played by um, investors. So I think we're going to have a very interesting year. The, the one wild factor will be what happens if the US public markets um, fall off um, in any significant way. Uh, that is traditionally something that's associated with a, a sharp fall in, in private funding in addition. Um, so interesting times ahead. Um, I think with that, I'm going to hand it back to Ray. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Nicola. And uh, I think uh, we'll move to our Q&A uh, portion of the uh, program and a reminder that uh, people can put their questions into the uh, Q&A portal on our screen. Uh, Nicola, uh, let me start with you and just a qu quick question about uh, Contain's mission a little bit. Uh, is it to de-risk investment in indoor agriculture? Is that... Uh, is that kind of where your mission lies? Um, a little bit. Actually, for us, the, the greater question is how do you give access to capital for the most to the most farmers? 
So when we first started Contain, we ran a survey and we discovered that nearly three quarters of um, farmers were looking for external funding. It's become a lot easier for folks to find that funding, but it's still an expensive endeavor, uh, particularly given that 80% of indoor farmers have never farmed before. So with Equip, for instance, we can get folks much cheaper equipment. Not everyone needs brand new equipment. Um, and you could instead pay 30, 40% of retail and get your um, farm up and running within however long it takes us to uh, get things onto a, um, onto a truck for you versus waiting much longer for, for brand new equipment. So it's really about improving access to capital and improving access to farming. Very good. Uh, Mary, there was a question put on the uh, screen uh, about uh, deep winter production of greens and the uh, average temperature you're trying to maintain uh, at the university when you're doing your, your tests. Uh, do you, yeah. know, do you have great some numbers question. for us? Yes, great question. So um, because these are completely um, reliant on solar energy, um, the temperatures in the greenhouse, and then the greenhouses are designed this way too. It, um, the glazing walls are um, are designed to be um, constructed at, a, at an angle to intercept the most sun <laughs> um, during um, the um, during the kind of the solstice period. So in our winter in our winter modes, when the sun's angle is very low in the sky, and so. Um, because we are very cold, but we're also, we also have the advantage in Minnesota of being quite sunny. Um, like even today, it's very cold, but um, we have um, good sun exposure. Um, it can get pretty warm in these greenhouses. And so during the day, the, the temperature is really reliant on how, how sunny it is outside. So sometimes they can reach, um, in, in the springtime, uh, temperatures of up to 100 degrees, which means you need to, of course, ventilate because that's a, a bit extreme. But the the way that it works at night is, is it's really critical for these crops to maintain um, proper temperatures above freezing um, at night. And so this is done by the installation of a gravel heat sink kind of bed in the foundation of these deep winter greenhouses so that um, heat is stored into this heat sink. And then through duct, duct work, the warm air is then disseminated throughout the greenhouse at night. And so the low temperatures at night are about, we wanna keep it about 45, 50. And so these are optimal for, for greens production. Of course, if you wanted to grow crops like tomatoes or peppers or anything that's a little bit more um, reliant on warmer temperatures, you'd have to provide some external kind of heating source. Um, and then some of the growers found that they can maximize their production too with, with adding supplemental um, energy efficient lighting but otherwise they're designed to be completely um, independent from, from electrical um, inputs. And Although energy costs for indoor farming uh, are high, I think Nicola uh, talked about that a little bit. And Jill, you even mentioned that you, you like uh, CEAs because of uh, uh, the load factor that Great River Energy is able to maintain. Give us a little more information on that. Uh, what did you mean by that? And, and how do CEAs help GRE with their load factor? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. I can get a little bit technical, but at the core, what it means is the, the loads of the lighting, the HVAC, the dehumidification, the water pumps, those loads can be very predictable. And so we can, um, when we're thinking of building out infrastructure from the transformers to the substations, to the transmission, all the way up to the power plants, we can easily predict what to expect at that particular facility. So it helps us in our long-term planning. And then also knowing those types of loads, we're very familiar with lighting because every facility has it. It's just, this, it's the same technology, but in a different application. And I should be careful to say the same. Um, grow lights are very different than indoor lighting. Um, so as we think about lighting as a load and what it what is required of lighting for grow applications, it's a load that's very predictable and it's very consistent with high run hours. And so that helps us achieve uh, economies of scale with our infrastructure and with our power plants. And at the end of the day, helps us keep our rates stable. So we're not having to build um, for peaks. Okay, thanks. Uh, 
and I would just encourage all three of our participants today to weigh in on any of these questions if you have uh, additional information you'd like to share. I have a question here. Why are containers so prevalent when there are technologies like Flex Farms from the company Fork Farms that have a much lower cost of entry and a much lower ongoing operational cost? Does anybody have any uh, knowledge of, of uh, what he called uh, Flex Farms? Uh, yeah, they're actually one of our vendors, so um, nice to uh, to hear them mentioned. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to take a shot, Mary. You'll probably have a better idea. But um, from a just a, a market perspective, from someone new coming into the industry, container farms are really well known, and so it tends to be where people start off because they're um, they're uh, just something that's very accessible. And in addition, um, we're seeing a proliferation of next generation container farms now. So they're becoming much easier to use, much more efficient. Um, and the uh, teams that are building them are becoming really good at educating um, farmers. But Mary, sorry, I didn't want to steal your thunder on that one. Mary, did you want to weigh in? Um, I, yeah, no, I think you, I think you covered it. I, I have nothing. Yeah, I think I, as, as far as yield efficiency per, per area, I really, I really think it does depend on, on um, the market for things and how much people are willing to spend. Considering the massive increase in yield efficiency per area, is the cost of energy growing indoors really more expensive on a per production unit basis than conventional farming? Somebody's trying to crunch the numbers uh, from both ways. Anybody want to take a stab at that one? If not, we can move on. I might just say that that, that is exactly what we are looking at right now with our soda grown container. Um, but we're also keeping in mind emissions. So what, what does it mean for utility emissions versus uh, diesel truck emissions in, in the kind of larger scope of farming? Um, what does it mean for water conservation, for land use? What does it mean for um, nutrients? Um, in a very controlled environment, you can optimize all of those things. In the field, it can be a lot more difficult. You have a lot more variables to manage. Mary, are any research being done on the uh, nutritional value of uh, fruits and vegetables yes. that are grown indoors <laughs> as opposed to conventional? Yeah, that's a great point to make. There is um, quite a bit of research being done in this area. If, when you can control the quality of light through artificial lighting and LED lighting um, and the ratios of red blue um, light that the plants receive, um, you can manipulate the phytonutrient content and um, produce um, higher quality nutritional quality products in this way. And a lot of this work is being done by um, a colleague, Dr. Sherry Kubota, who's at the Ohio State University. Her research, research is really focused on nutritional quality and quality of controlled environment agriculture. Um, furthermore, one of the benefits is the closer you can get um, to your consumers, the fresher that product is when it hits their plate, the better nutritional quality it will be rather than trucking things, shipping things long distance all the way from California and then storing them in refrigeration and then they hit the grocery store shelves and then eventually to the consumer. So that's a really um, great added benefit is that the quality is fresher, they last longer. Um, so there's a real argument I think that can be made for um, localizing um, some of this food production here. Uh, Nicole, I wanted to come back to you and talk a little bit about the equipped platform that you have. Is that uh, membership driven or can anybody uh, buy and sell on that uh, platform? Um, anyone can come onto it and buy and sell. We obviously run some checks before we list um, uh, items, but it's available to list um, pretty much anything within indoor agriculture from um, lights, uh, container farms, uh, grow systems, uh, robotics equipment. Uh, we've seen a number of micro harvesters come through it um, and then consumables as well. So if you have a cupboard that of lights or uh, jiffy plugs that you intended using and have realized you're never going to install um, or use, then uh, we'd love to have them listed on the platform. And the uh, URL is equipped.farm. What a great idea, I think, uh, for anybody who's ever started farming or has wanted to upgrade their farming equipment, uh, you're always looking for a, a better deal. And it, it sounds like this would be a, this could be a much better way to 
take care of some of that rather than always purchasing new. Yeah, and we see a number of uh, farmers coming on and you know, they, they may not uh, buy the entire farm from us, but they'll buy some additional lights or um, you know, they'll, they'll suddenly get a winter lettuce order and they'll need to expand really quickly. Um, and it's not always possible to get brand new equipment um, uh, quickly enough nowadays. Another question from a participant today for deep winter growing is the solar passive only or are you supplementing with solar PV and cold climate heat pumps? Are you just using the sun, Mary? Right. So um, they um, the designs um, for deep winter greenhouses um, have been drawn up by a colleague, um, Dan Handeen at the University of Minnesota, and he's in sustainable building design. And they're all publicly accessible and available online. And I shared the link in the chat. Um, but but the designs that he has are, are, are mostly focused on completely um, running completely without external energy sources. Although there are some growers who are in the network who are um, optimizing, customizing, kind of experimenting, doing their own things. Um, so I think we'll see designs evolve. And um, in my experience, one of the great things about this network is that um, the farmers are really um, willing to share their knowledge and experience and information and learn um, so that there's a lot of um, free exchange <laughs> of, um, of information um, across this platform. So it's really nice to see that as it will help grow new growers and grow the industry as a whole. Who wants to talk a little bit about the feasibility of scaling this up? And uh, uh, using, you know, who knows where the end users are and what kinds of things should be taken into account uh, uh, before you cite a uh, CEA? Well, it can be scaled. Um, we've seen, we have really large controlled environment ag um, producers here in the state um, in Bushel Boy Farms and Revel Farms, which are um, also expanding in, into other states as I understand it. And so, um, so they're serving, it's just a little bit of a different um, market at that point because you're serving then a regional market and not just um, um, your local market, but you also have to have the investment cost, the startup cost can be kind of significant. So you have investors and, and, and folks that are supporting the, um, the construction of those new buildings, and, as well as a lot of the expertise that they were, um, I believe that they um, that they relied on early on is from um, folks over in um, the Netherlands and, and in Europe where controlled environment has really been done for a lot longer. <laughs> and there's a lot, um, we're, we're, we're kind of a little bit in, in some ways behind the curve, um, but in, in playing catch up in this area in some ways in the US, but yeah. I have a question also about uh, what other buildings might be uh, able to be used. Uh, just about every community has a box store that's uh, either gone out of business or has uh, changed its business model. And uh, it's, can, can we do indoor farming in some of these buildings or is the retrofit to get them ready uh, just not feasible? I'm gonna add a, a couple comments to that when I saw Nicola smile about that. Um, in Minnesota, I'm not familiar with any specific stories on that, but I know it on the East Coast, they have taken old abandoned like factories and converted them to uh, indoor agriculture warehousing. And when you're thinking about retrofitting a facility like that, the, the key things that we're finding is um, you need to design your lighting and you need to design your HVAC system for mostly for cooling, but also dehumidification uh, to manage the quality of your crops. So you can definitely use existing facilities, but there's important design considerations um, when you're when you're making a change like that. Nicola, did you want to uh, weigh in on uh, using old buildings to uh, grow indoors? No, sure, and you know this is this is a complicated one. I'll talk about the economic perspective because I'm sure uh, Mary could talk about the in particular de the dehumidification issue in existing buildings. So uh, one of the challenges we've seen with existing buildings is folks think that they can just roll some um, some grow systems in and get going. And typically that's not something that um, is going to be acceptable from either an insurance or a, a health and safety point of view. 
Um, and so one of the things that um, we always, always encourage folks to do is look at the retrofit costs. So we see in certain locations for certain buildings, obviously it's building by building, it can be a lot more expensive to retrofit an existing building into something that's uh, usable than it would be to start from scratch. Having said which, there are obviously successful examples of repurposing um, uh, repurposing other buildings. So I think something like 90% of Taiwan's indoor farms are actually in essentially office buildings. Um, there's a project going on in Chicago uh, where an old Target is being retrofitted and then Era Farms, um, their first farm in uh, New Jersey was obviously a, a retrofit as well. I have a question here that uh, someone stole the question I was going to use to wrap things up, but we'll take it now. Where will the CEA industry be in five years or 10 years? And more specifically, Mary, they were wondering where you think your research is going to be uh, focusing in, the, in 10 years. So uh, we'll let all three of you kind of weigh in on that. Where do you think this, this CEA industry will be in the next five to 10 years? And uh, Mary, you're on the screen, so we'll maybe start with you. Um, I'm expecting that we're going to see some major increases in, in the near future with CEA, and this is um, for a multiple um, assortment of reasons. Um, we have climate change issues that are making farming, outdoor farming, open air farming, soil based farming, just a lot more risky and challenging. Um, we're seeing most of our specialty crops are produced in California, and, and California is facing a major climate crisis right now with droughts, and so we're going to need more water use efficiency for sure. Um, so I, I um, I expect um, we'll have more of our food being grown indoors in, in 10 years than we do now. And I really think one of the major focuses um, right now is on labor and, and far labor and farming is a huge challenge. And in controlled environment production, we have an advantage of, of um, automating some of these systems or um, designing systems that can be um, harvested a little bit more efficiently and, and using less human labor. And so there's, um, I think innovations in automation and remote sensing and really optimizing growing in these systems that we're going to see. Um, so lots of lots more tech <laughs> in the future. And Jill, I saw you nodding in agreement. Uh, where do you see CEAs in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, I think Mary really nailed it. I think we're going to continue to see more and more. And I, I think it really speaks to this idea of resiliency. So how do we become more resilient when there's things like supply chain issues, if but then it also speaks, you know, that locally grown piece gives us a little bit more economic resiliency um, when there's conflict in other countries that affect our supply chain, our food supply chain. And I think that's very, you know, very relevant with what's going on in Russia and Ukraine right now. Um, but that could just as easily be anywhere else in, in the world as well. It's all interconnected. So sure. I think that resiliency piece, which again ties back to climate change as well, is um, what this industry is really speaking to. You're fading in and out a little bit, your audio, but I think we caught most of that message. Uh, Nicola, let's go to you for the five to 10 year outlook. So, so I think the only thing I'd add to, to Mary and Jill's comments is that um, I'm, our, our greatest hope is that we start to see a, a broader variety of crops grown within these systems. And that's really down to work of the work of uh, folks like Mary um, to uh, help make that happen. And in particular, um, I think there's a, an enormous opportunity for that. some of the high value crops that have long, messy supply chains, uh, things like vanilla, saffron, um, to be uh, located closer to uh, the final production areas. Um, and to uh, thereby remove a lot of the environmental and human rights issues within those chains. Um, and then uh, on the, the other end of the scale, um, your staples have always been a dream for, for many within the industry. And we're starting to see research around things like rice. Uh, in Singapore, they just um, harvested a rice crop um, uh, in a, a vertical farm. Now, I'm not suggesting this is gonna happen tomorrow, um, there's enormous um, economic and um, biological um, hurdles that have to be overcome to make that happen. But I think if we have any dream for the industry, it has to be to have a bigger uh, societal impact. Well said, and I think we'll leave it there uh, today. I want to thank uh, Mary Rogers, uh, Jill Eide, and uh, Nicola Kerslake uh, for their contribution to our uh, 
program today and uh, for the great presentations and for taking the time to answer our questions as well. Thanks so much. Remember, a recording of this entire conversation is going to be made available at AURI.org. Also, that concludes AURI Connects Fields of Innovation for today, presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. AURI's mission is to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. And here's an invitation to join AURI on the Fields of Innovation Facebook group for future postings of events and interesting content. Thank you for participating today, and we hope that you will join us for part two of this CEA series coming up on March 18th from noon till one o'clock central time for a panel discussion with CEA industry entrepreneurs to learn more about their businesses and how they're using indoor egg technologies to build sustainable, precise, and scalable CEA operations in Minnesota. And part three will be aired on April 28th, which will conclude with an in-person facility tour and some networking events later that afternoon. One other event that I want to invite you to is our fourth annual New Uses Forum, coming both virtually and in person to the Earl Brown Heritage Center in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. It's coming up March 23rd and 24th, and you can find all the details of that event and the registration information at auri.org. I hope you'll register and join us March 23rd and 24th for our New Uses Forum. Remember to visit the Fields of Innovation Facebook page, and for more information on Fields of Innovation or any of the work that AURI participates in, you can go to auri.org.